alumni, I'm Vanessa Nemunitis. I'm a partner in our Dallas office in the banking and finance group. In addition to my practice, I also participate in a number of the firm's diversity initiatives and cultural aspects, which I'm sure you all enjoyed as well at your time at Weill. I'm a leader in the Weill Latinx group, Women at Weill, a member of the Professional Development Committee and the hiring partner in the Dallas office. I am so excited to join you today on the next edition of our WILE WOW alumni interview series with Liani Kocher, a distinguished alum. Liani was a litigation associate in our Dallas office and our Silicon Valley office and is now an acclaimed author. She writes young adult novels under the pen name Rectoc Ross and her most recent published publication, The Survival Thriller, which I picked up this weekend and really enjoyed, Ski Weekend, was a 2021 American Fiction Awards finalist in the young adult category and was also the best book of the fall for She Reads, Cosmopolitan, Yahoo Life, and a number of other publications. Liani, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, it's so amazing to be back at Wild. It's great to have you. I guess just first, congratulations again on the amazing success of Ski Weekend. I imagine that a lot of hard work went into this. How does it feel to be on the other side to have received such acclaim and success for Ski Weekend? Well, it feels awesome. So this has been a dream of mine for many, many years. The book itself was over 10 years between writing it, querying for agents, wearing to publishers and then actually publishing it. So it feels a little bit like, which I hope, you know, my wild colleagues will remember working on a case for a very long period of time, or, you know, those big transactions we used to do and then getting the win, but not just being the lawyer, but I'm both the lawyer and the client. So it really, it just feels amazing. Like the culmination of so many years of hard work. That's amazing. Um, one of the one of the aspects of your process that I was interested in was just the book tour, right? I mean, to your point, years yeah. and years, and then to go out in the world and really meet your readers. Um, what, what can you tell us about that process? Absolutely. So it's really interesting. So I stepped into the world of being an author. I mean, number one, COVID, right? It's really unprecedented times for how you're going to connect with your readership, you know, it's hard to do things in person. But then on top of that, I'm also kind of like the new era of writers where 10, 15 years ago, there was really the big machine of, you know, the five, or I think now it's four big publishers, and they kind of ruled everything. And now there's been a huge explosion of breakthrough indie, we're really living in a golden era of creation. And so you're competing with not just five big houses, but you're competing with all the indie publishers, all the creators, and there's really limited shelf space and there's really limited attention of booksellers. So coupled with COVID as well and all the challenges that brought on, it was really an interesting time, but I feel like I used a lot of the skill set I learned as a while attorney to kind of get in front of people. And I think for me, what was really important, I remember learning this kind of like as a baby's lawyer at while was that you really need to make the offer or the brief so good that, you know, the judge, whoever's hearing it can't resist, but put the win in your favor. And so I really had to make an effort. I got a lot of no's when I first started out trying to get in front of bookstores and, you know, to couple with foundations to do book release parties. At first, everyone wanted to say no, 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 because I was a debut author. They didn't know who I was. I didn't have like this huge body of work. And so I realized I had to kind of take it back a notch and go back to that lesson of you need to make sure that what you're offering others is so good that, you know, you have to get the win. And so I really redesigned these book launches that had huge New York Times bestselling authors attached, you know, big influencers to moderate. I had friends that were journalists that came on board. I even got like pretty insane to think about, but a big Hollywood actress, Jennifer Morrison, signed on to help oh, do my amazing. LA launch. It, it really was so incredible, but honestly, it was hard work on my end that made all those opportunities possible. I didn't have a huge publisher to unlock those doors. And so I had to come with, you know, this ask that really no one could say no to. Once I had everything packaged, they had to say yes. And so I think in challenging times, 
you really have to kind of go back to basics and you have to make what you're doing so incredible that people aren't going to say no to it. It reminded me, I really enjoyed your book. I also enjoyed you. the first page you know, for those who said yes, when everyone else said no. Yes. And as soon as I read that, I knew I was going to love your book. I didn't even have to pick up the deck because I could feel immediately just the hard work. And I mean, anything you put that much time and dedication into is going to be successful. I'm just so glad that you, you know, on the other side of it, you know, you're, you're getting that feedback. Um, but it, it is interesting that, you know, you put your time into that and then you have to go out and sell it. Um, and oh you've my got God. to engage people. I feel like as professionals, we find it hard sometimes to market ourselves. We can, we can, you know, maybe talk about our colleagues. Um, we can talk about while and how amazing it is. But sometimes it really is important to be able to speak up for ourselves and, and to really market ourselves and, and brand ourselves. What advice do you have now coming through this amazing process um, for our for our while alum and, and attorneys um, on that? Yeah, so I love that. So especially, I think, you know, obviously everyone's listening to this. So not to the exclusion of any other gender, but I think women especially have a really tough time, um, you know, talking about themselves, um, you know, kind of bragging on themselves a little bit. And I think I learned, it's so funny because so much of this harkens back to being at Wild. I had some really amazing, strong female partners and also male partners who were really supportive of women coming up. And I was at Wild, you know, it's always changing. But even when I started, you know, so long ago, 2004, you know, it was just starting to turn where there was a lot of women. And so there was still a lot of this, you know, dichotomy between, you know, women trying to rise up, you know, not having a lot of women in, you know, the boardroom, the courtroom, the deposition rooms. And I had a lot of strong mentors tell me, you really have to stand up for yourself. You really are going to have to be your biggest cheater, your, you know, biggest cheerleader, biggest supporter, because no one's going to do that for you. Um, and I would say, especially as a woman, but really anyone, I think you have to get really comfortable with, shouting your accolades to the world, because if you don't do it, you know, who is going to do it? And then to talk about your second point about branding, uh, one of the most interesting experiences I had at while, and this is when I was in the Dallas office, I remember they hired a PR firm to come in and to help the associates. And it was such an incredible learning experience because, you know, they don't teach you this in law school, but while was super proactive about and I, I'm sure they're still doing stuff like this, but about, you know, really having ownership of your brand. And I remember even, you know, a little shout out to Glenn West. He was such a huge proponent of this in the Dallas office about really educating, you know, young attorneys about how important it is to really own your brand, own your niche, to become an expert. So not just be a general, you know, commercialist in litigation or, you know, business law or whatever, but to have an area that everyone knew that you were an expert in. And so I think it's the same thing in, in writing and, you know, publishing books. I really, you know, if anyone wants to go look at my website, Rec Talk Ross, or my Instagram at Rec Talk Ross, you'll see everything I do is very strategic about my branding. You'll know right away when you look that I am a thriller. I'm a young adult thriller author. And I'm, you know, I make no apologies about that. It's what I put forward every time I speak. And so I'm getting recognition now through podcasts through media, guest posts, you know, op-eds as, you know, building my brand as an expert in this space. And I think it's so funny because so much of that learning about how to brand really did start at while. And so I feel like I had kind of like a head up um, moving into the author world because it's very similar. There's so much competition, really the only way to get out and in front of the pack is to distinguish yourself in some way. That's amazing. I, I love this shout out to Glenn because he's still doing it today. <laughs> Liani and I didn't cross paths at Wild, but we certainly have um, similar experiences. I mean, Glenn, for me too. I mean, it's um, it, it's amazing. I found the resources and support and I agree. We, we I went through something similar with respect to branding and it did mm -hmm. not come naturally to me. It didn't feel authentic at the beginning, but the more you practice it, I really felt like the, the better I was able to, to get at it. And sometimes it's a hit and a miss, right? You try something on, um, but I, I, I love that. 
So Liani, you were incredibly successful as a litigator at Weill. So I'm curious to hear about why you decided to transition from law to being an author. Yeah, so it was actually an incredibly difficult decision for me because I really loved my time at Weill. I had many like amazing coworkers. Um, I, you know, all the cases were high profile, wonderful clients, very prestigious. And I worked a really long time to get that kind of an opportunity. But even at a really young age, I always loved storytelling. You know, I was the kid in, you know, junior high and high school that had those black and white cause, you know, journals where you'd write all your thoughts into it. And I would tell stories. And I, you know, I was part of the generation. I was an 80s baby where we were, you know, one of the first uh, generation of women that we could you know, go out and we could be lawyers and we could be doctors and we could be businesswomen. And there was a lot of push, you know, from my family, also external to really take advantage of that. And so as much as I loved storytelling and writing in my journal, you know, my family was really of the mindset that I should go to college and go to law school and, you know, get a real job. And so that's really the path. I Sounds was familiar. <laughs> I, it sounds familiar, right? So that's the path that I started off on. And I really did enjoy my time at Weill, but probably around, I would say the third or fourth year um, being at the firm, I really started to miss having that creative outlet. And as much as I loved, you know, writing briefs and oral argument, I think I would put a lot of that creativity into the briefs and into my arguments. Um, there's a real difference between a technical legal brief and obviously a creative writing um, story. And so the firm was amazing at the time I was in the Dallas office. And I remember bringing it to um, the attention of some of the partners. And they said, look, as long as you know, you can get everything done that you need to get done for your clients. If you want to, you know, go take a class or something in we're fine, we'll support you with that. And they were really wonderful. I took classes at SMU, I went once a week. And I remember I would be in the office working on my brief or research or whatever. And then I, you know, drive my little car down the street to SMU. I would take the course for two hours and then I'd go back to the office and, you know, it was pretty seamless and it was a really, you know, eye-opening part of my life where I did it for about two years. And I got to a point where I had a full on manuscript written. And I think it gave me a lot of confidence that this is something I could really do. It wasn't just a pipe dream. And so probably after I'd written that first book, I really knew that this is what I was super passionate about. And I also did have a little bit of a health scare um, later on when I was at Silicon Valley in the Silicon Valley office. And that really, I think, is what kind of cemented in my mind that I felt like the path was for me to do something different. And that was really a good time to start thinking about a transition and what was next for me. I think it's just incredibly courageous. T two things. One, switching your careers completely, but also just speaking up for yourself, right? Taking yeah. taking that minute to just t talk to your to your folks and just say, look, th this is something that's important to me and it's it's part of who I am. Um, and it's a part that I, you know, need to build up. So I just I commend you so much for for speaking up because I think a lot of folks decide not to, and you know, I'll go one more year and it'll be fine, it'll work itself out. Um, and you know, for me, I, I think sometimes just the thought of tackling that change that's gonna come, um, whether it's your routine, who you speak to every day, certainly for yeah. you, a totally different you know, career path, H how did you, um, how did you deal with that change in, in your routine and, and, you know, what you did every day? Did, do you have any tips for us? Yeah. So I love talking about, um, transition and not just, you know, I made the full leap from a lawyer to an author, but even helping people really just infuse a little bit of creativity in their life. So they want to stay being a lawyer or, you know, general counsel or whatever, but they just want to get back in touch with the creative aspects of their life. And maybe it's a weekend or a hobby thing. I love talking about both. I feel like, especially now with COVID, a lot of people are interested in how do I tap back into that part of me, you know, that I enjoyed as a kid. And so I think, you know, the first tip is don't be afraid to ask for help. And I definitely was scared, <laughs> a little bit nervous to tell the people on my team that, you know, this is something that really interests me and excites me. And I'm not leaving while, but, you know, gee, it'd be great if I could find a way to explore that and have some balance. And it turned out, you know, wonderful. It was a great opportunity for me. And I eventually even went on flex time and everyone was so supportive of that. And if I had been too scared 
you know, to, to say something, I obviously would have missed out. And so I think, you know, don't underestimate asking for help. You know, people do want to support you. Um, they want you to be happy, right? Um, and then I think not just asking for support or help of your coworkers and your family, of course, as well is super important. But I think um, I had a really wonderful opportunity to work with a business coach, which I never would have thought of as a lawyer. You know, we don't have, like our career path is very solid as a lawyer. You, you know, go to college, you go to law school, you get good grades, you get a job. Um, author is completely different. Transitioning to an author is completely different. And for me, I think working with a business coach really helped me figure out how do I make this leap? There's so many considerations, you know, financial, um, mentally, emotionally. How do you leave something you've been? I was there for over a decade. You know, how do you make that switch? And, you know, just like people hire us for our legal expertise, there's people out there that, you know, can help, you know, pivot or even if it's not a pivot, they can help you, you know, figure out how to infuse that aspect, you know, in your life, if you're looking to put more creativity in, how to do that in a healthy way. So I think for me, it's really asking for help and finding good resources. Yeah, I, I definitely, I mean, it does seem linear, right? To your point that the path yeah. that we all go on and, and as someone who started off at a law firm and ended up making partner at a law firm, I'm sure it seems like, well, that was the path the whole way. But even for me, I, I think you're right. There are so many resources out there that I appreciate so much more now around coaching and, you know, a business um, experience and um, just really trying to grow your talent outside of just the legal space um, that can just prepare you, you know, for lots of opportunities out there. Um, you, you mentioned it earlier, but if, is there anything else about maybe your time at Wild that you feel like you draw upon in your you know, new life as an author um, and, and, you know, those experiences? Yes, absolutely. So you don't have to be a wild gotchall attorney to be a successful author, but I certainly don't think that it hurts. So I had so many, you know, interesting life lessons or professional lessons at Wild that have really, you know, moved over with me and translated into my career as an author. I think, you know, the first one, we touched on this a little bit about being your biggest cheerleader, but even a step further than that, I think is being aggressive about your career and really taking ownership of it. I had, it's really unbelievable to me. And one day I'm gonna be on Oprah and tell the entire story of, you know, the path I went on, but I had so many no's. And it's like, you know, you read the, um, the beginning of my book and it really, that's really like what happened to me for 10 years. Some people say no. And I think just refusing to listen to the no's, to really believe in yourself, be aggressive, be passionate, keep after it, so many opportunities have come my way because I refused to hear the no. And I just kept, you know, making my offer so great that they had to eventually say yes. I've had so many, I'm going to be a speaker at the LA Times Book Festival. It's like one of the biggest. Oh, book that's amazing. No, I, I'm, thank you. I'm so excited. And really the organizers emailed me and said, like, we, we really like the book and you've got a lot of great accolades, but we actually want you on the stage because you're one of the few people that, did, you know, kept emailing us and kept on it. So thank you for your persistence. So I think be persistent, be aggressive. I think um, another like number two that I really want to share, and it was such an incredible lesson that I learned in a funny way at while is don't take anything personal. So I had so many instances and I know Vanessa that you've had this too, where I would email a partner or a client or, you know, even just someone outside the firm, some kind of community development thing. And, you know, they don't respond. Or it's a very short, terse response. And I think, you know, outside of while of the experience we've had, you know, you might get in your head and think, oh, they don't like me. They don't like what I have to say. They're annoyed at me. They're not interested. But working at while, I knew like, no, they're just busy. People are really busy. And so you'd have to keep following up. You'd have to, you know, call the, you know, someone's executive admin and get them on the phone and become friends with them and send the email with their name in the ray line. So then they pay attention. And eventually get creative. get creative to get the response that you want. And eventually that, you know, hopefully they respond and you realize it had nothing to do with you. It's not personal. You never should have taken it personal. They were just really busy. And so I think like that has really served me well. It's not taking on anything as personal, just realizing people are dealing with their own stuff. They're busy. If you want it, you just got to keep going after it. And it's not, you know, don't let your feelings be heard. It's not a feeling or a personal thing. It's business. 
I love that. Um, it's, you know, so it's a new year. We're recording this in January. Um, and I feel like this conversation has just honestly energized me for the new year. Just thinking about oh. reflecting on our common experiences. And I re it really resonates with me that, you know, don't take no for an answer. You know, th that's not the end. Um, I'm curious for you coming out, you know, 2021, such a great year um, for your professionally. And, you know, what are your professional resolutions or hopes for 2022 um, that you're looking forward to? So this is so cool. So I'm a huge fan of Disney as, um, you know, I think they were a client when I was there. Um, I just, I love how they run their business and they actually put out, which I thought was so amazing for, you know, an entertainment company do, they put out their pillars for the year. And that really inspired me to kind of write my own pillars. And so for me, for this year, my three pillars are film. So I really want to, um, get more into the film world. And so when I wrote Ski Weekend, for those of you who have read it, and hopefully those of you who will read it, you'll see it's very cinematic. And that was very purposeful. I always had in mind that this would one day be a uh, book um, book adaptation into film or TV. And I'm very excited to announce I did sign with a manager. And we are going to be pitching the book probably next month to film and TV studios. So That's amazing. I Hey, I'm so excited. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of, you know, good news coming soon in the works for that. So definitely expanding film and TV put like footprint. Um, as far as books, I have actually already written the second book. So it's a follow up to Ski Weekend. It is not a direct sequel, but it's in the Ski Weekend universe. And so that will be going on sub hopefully soon. That means it goes to for, <laughs> for those who don't speak the yeah, translate language. for us. <laughs> sub means it goes out to publishers. Um, for acquisition. And so hopefully that will be happening in a few months. So maybe we'll see a book too. That would be wonderful. And then the third area, which I have spoken to, which I think is really important for lawyers as well, is building platform. And so this is the year I really want to expand on my platform as an expert in the young adult author space. And so I do have a pretty good Facebook presence. I have a Facebook group. Um, I'm also on social media at Rec Talk Ross. If anyone wants to connect there, I love meeting people online. Um, and then I am in the process of launching a thriller podcast with a director, actor of my friend, uh, director, actor, friend of mine. And, I, you know, we're going to be telling stories that are thrilling. So not just film and TV and book thrillers, but um, anything ranging from cybersecurity thrilling issues and attacks to true crime, to urban legends um, and myths as well. So. I'm super excited to really dive more into the world of thrillers. Wow, that is that is a lot for the year. <laughs> I'm excited for all of it. I can absolutely agree that this has to be a movie ski weekend. It has I cannot wait to see it. Um, I know it's going to happen because I, I can't imagine um, it not. So um, with that, I guess just thank you, Liani, for just sharing with us your your experiences. Um, it's just like I said, just a great way to kick off the new year. Happy new year to all our alumni. Um, and we, you know, we look forward to reconnecting with more of these interviews soon. Thank you, Liani. Thank you so much for having me.